You need winners? Let the sports advisor show you how to make money. General Manager Al DeMarco, a former sports reporter and contributor on Fox Sports, MSNBC, and Comcast Sports TV, brings over 25 years of handicapping experience to the table. Rick Torino, a 25-year handicapping expert, spent over a decade as a college and pro football editor at a national wire service. Together, they are the Sports Advisors, your number one source for winners. It's hard to believe we are in week number five of the college football season, already into October. Three college coaches have already been canned, and a few more are definitely on the hot seat. One guy who is absolutely on fire is the guy I'm here on the show with, Rick Torino, the hottest handicapper at thesportsadvisors.com, a cool 9-1 and one in the NFL and college football over the past two weeks. Nine wins, one losses. What does that mean? Well, $10 bettors have netted out $6,400. Props to you. Last weekend in college football, you cashed in with Virginia on Thursday. Your big play, Washington uh, State getting the job done on Saturday. Me, on the other hand, I got backdoored by Tennessee. And for the second time this year, Florida screwed me. I just can't believe the Florida Gators, but hey, you're winning. So again, props to you. Well, thanks, Al. I appreciate it. Uh, we were on a roll. Uh, we're going to try and continue to stay on that roll. And we just got very lucky with that Washington State game, Al. That was our big play re- we released on the site. But Hey, we'll take it. We've lost games like that before over the years as well. So, And as I always say, you know, not only do the gambling gods sometimes smile upon you, but everything is cyclical in gambling. If the dogs cover big time one week, the favorites could easily come back the next week. If I keep losing like I did last weekend, I may win this weekend. You never can tell. But listen, uh, nine and one in football the past two weekends. People have no idea how tough it is to win nine out of 10. But let's get going here. We've got some interesting games. For those of you that are new to the show, as I always like to tell you, Rick and I pick the games we're going to talk about, but we never actually discuss the games in advance. We just select them from the big board. And when we talk about them here, that's the first time you and I and Rick are discussing them together. So with that being said, let's get to the first game on the board. Michigan, a 10 and a half point favorite at Iowa. Of course, this is a rematch of last year's Big Ten title game in Indianapolis, where Michigan absolutely rolled the Hawkeyes 42 to three. Iowa coming off back to back wins over Rutgers and Nevada. (laughs) Big deal. (laughs) This is still the team that uh, you know, got upset at home by Iowa State. Uh, their defense is certainly for real. Their offense is putrid. So, Rick, I'll ask you this. Do you take an Iowa team that perhaps can't score 10 points plus the double digits at home, or do you lay it with a Michigan team that, as we noted last week, should have beaten Maryland big time at home at the big house, but couldn't even get the job done laying the double digits against the Terrapins? Well, Al, this is a tough play either way you look at it. I'm kind of leading a little little to Iowa getting the grabbing the points at home, just relying on their defense. Um, I know we have said over the week since the start of the season how bad this Iowa offense has been. Uh, since 2009, Iowa is 5-3 and three straight up against Michigan. Uh, at home, getting double digits. Um, I think I have a slight lean toward Iowa. Uh, we, Iowa's not one of our favorite plays this year, but I think uh, – I have a slight play on Iowa this year, uh, this week against Michigan. You know, the only play I've had involving Iowa this season is when I went against them and I backed Iowa State. And, of course, the Cyclones won that came out right. The defense is for real. I mean, 23 points allowed in four games, ranked sixth in the nation, only giving up 236 yards a game. The problem is the offense is dead last in the nation, averaging 232 yards a game. What worries me here is that Michigan's quarterback, and of course this is the first road game for the Wolverines, Michigan's quarterback, relatively inexperienced, J.J. McCarthy. You know, last week against Maryland, 220 yards passing, a couple of touchdowns. He came so close to having a couple of costly turnovers. Luckily, a fumble was recovered. A near interception did not turn into a pick. But this is going to be a different environment for a young quarterback. And the other thing that gets me is that Michigan's defense against Maryland, 
I mean, they allowed 397 yards. They allowed the Terrapins, granted, a much better offensive team than Iowa could ever dream to be, to go nine for 17 on third and fourth downs. Uh, but Maryland shot themselves in the foot. Three turnovers in that game. So I'm kind of like with you. I, I would grab the points with Iowa in revenge, but boy, not a game that I would have any interest in whatsoever. It's one of those games, like I always joke with you, if you paid me, I'd probably take Iowa, but otherwise I wouldn't <laughs> even watch this game. Uh, hey. <laughs> yeah, Al, Alan, you make, and you make a good point, Al, that uh, the revenge, I think that's going to play a big factor because uh, I, Iowa was totally dominated last year in that Big Ten championship by Michigan. Michigan rolled up 461 yards. I think it's going to be a different uh, atmosphere Saturday. And with Michigan on the road, their first road game of the year in the Big Ten. So, uh, well, we'll grab the points with Iowa. Okay, guys, remember, if you always want to be alerted to when our college football pregame show is available, when the NFL pregame show is available that I do with Steve Budin, make sure you subscribe to the channel. You can see the little subscribe now button right there floating on your screen. So make sure you do that so you never miss an episode. And of course, you can always catch it and download it on the podcast version as well, available on Spotify, over on iHeartRadio, over on Stitcher, or over on the Apple Podcast Network. Uh, the next one, SEC Showdown, Mississippi at home against Kentucky. Rick, I looked at this line and I was very surprised because Ole Miss opened up at five, five and a half, now six and a half as we shoot this show on Tuesday night. Are you surprised at how big of a favorite the Rebels are in this game? I am, Al. Exactly right. Even though this has been a series dominated by Ole Miss and Oxford, winning eight of the last ten straight up. Um, what I like in this, Al, is, well, I did, and three of the last four of the total have gone over. I do like, I do think this game will go over. This could be a shootout back and forth. Really, really like Kentucky's quarterback, Will Levis. And the big key return this week, they get the good running back, Chris Rodriguez, back. I'm t I like Kentucky in the points this week. That's the way I'm going. Um, Levis is just, I just can't see him ever, see Kentucky ever out of a game. Last week, 303 yards, four touchdowns. Granted, it was against Northern Illinois, but, but he throws it all over the lot. And I, I like this Kentucky team. And like I said earlier, with the return of Rodriguez uh, to boost that running game, they, they, this should be really a good game. And to grab six points, you know, let it go up even higher. I'll tell you, you know, give me seven if it's going to go that high. I don't think it'll go that high. It could go to six and a half, though. Well, a lot of books at six and a half right now as we talk on Tuesday night. So you can buy up the half point to seven, which I would always recommend doing. And, and people don't realize what you just hit on, the importance of Chris Rodriguez Jr. coming back, suspended for the first four games. Last year, 1,379 yards, 4.7 yards per carry. Without him, without any consistent ground game, the Kentucky offensive line has had real problems protecting their quarterback. He was sacked five times last week by Northern Illinois, 16 sacks in four games this season already. And although Ole Miss did not get any sacks last week, the Rebels defense has 13 sacks through four games this season. Now, playing devil's advocate just for a second before I get my pick, the three home wins by Kentucky en route to their 4-0 start, Miami of Ohio, Youngstown State, and then Northern Illinois, a game in which the Wildcats were a 26-point favorite, and it was a tough, tough game for them to win 31-23. But what did they do for the one road win? They go to Florida, and although the final score said 26-16 in the Swamp, they totally dominated the Gators in that contest. And then I look at Old Miss. Well, who the hell did they play? Troy? Central Arkansas? Georgia Tech? And they struggled against Tulsa, 35-27. So, all things being equal, I'm with you. I would grab whatever points I get, and I think it's going to be a game that's a three or four point game. So I'm with you in taking the live road dog in this particular contest. Totally agree with the Al uh, looking for Kentucky. Hey, and we both know they don't have to win the game. Let's just, you know, let's just keep it close enough within a touchdown and we're, we'll be happy and come away with a win that way. And again, guys, we're doing this show here for you on Tuesday night. 
be aware of a couple of significant injuries for Ole Miss. Now, they have a very deep backfield. Zach Evans, who came over from TCU, uh, Lane Kiffin said it was a medical thing. I don't know what that means, but he did not play in the second half uh, this past week against Tulsa. Ulysses Bennett, the fourth, who came over through the transport portal out of SMU, he's only had 14 carries this year. God knows if he's going to play. Now, they still had 308 yards rushing against Tulsa. Kentucky's a little stronger, obviously, in terms of stopping the run, but it's something that you've got to be aware of, and you've got to definitely look at the uh, injury report for Ole Miss as you get closer to game time. Before we get to the next game, oh, this is going to be a good game to talk about, the Pac-12 battle between Utah and Oregon State. Remember, you can get my best bet, Rick's best bet, and the best bets of all 10, minimum 10 handicappers at thesportsadvisors.com by using the one-day free all-access pass, no strings attached. Just go to thesportsadvisors.com, click on that free one-day all-access pass. You get all of our plays for free. In fact, you can pick the day. Saturday's plays, Sunday's plays, you have the option. It's a $99 value if you were to buy it separately. And in reality, if you were to get 10 handicappers plays and buy them all separately, it's well worth over $1,000 if you were to buy those plays again individually. Again, the one day all access pass. The reason we do it is we like to pull back the curtain. It's the best way for you to get a taste, a sample of what we're doing over at thesportsadvisors.com. Uh, by the way, if you had taken advantage of it last weekend, you would have won a fortune just getting Rick's best bets. Uh, not a bad weekend for him. Again, 5-1, and 5-0 and oh, two weekends ago, 4-1 and one last week. And by the way, Rick, how the hell, after nine straight wins, did you lose with the New York Giants on Monday? I mean, we're going to have to fire you off the site. I, I mean, you didn't have the Cowboys on Monday night for 10 straight wins. I mean, just... Uh. <laughs> Can't trust you. I mean, couldn't make it 10 in that, a row. You ruined the whole damn thing. I but anyway, know. what can I say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Always excuses. Uh, Guy hey, goes. Hey, I'm just, I'm, I'm just glad baseball's winding down, and we got some playoff baseball going already. <laughs> uh, okay, listen. Next game, Utah. Uh, this is a game I was quite surprised with too. Now I know Utah. Their only regular season loss last year in Pac-12 play was at uh, Corvallis when the Oregon State Beavers ran for 260 yards and a 42-34 win. But my God, this is another game I don't understand the line because Utes are at home. They're a ten and a half point favorite against Oregon State. Are you surprised at the line in this particular contest? Uh, surprised at the line, Al, but I, I like uh, laying the 10, 10 or 10 and a half. I think this is a very difficult spot for Oregon State. Coming off that game they played last Saturday night at home against USC, the four costly turnovers, um, plus an early kickoff in uh, in Utah this week. I really think they're, they're in for their hands full. This is a Utah team that's rolling now since that opening week loss to Florida in a game they very well could have run, could have won, you know. So they're looking to keep those Pac-12 championship hopes alive. And like I said, just a, a, a devastating loss for Oregon State last week. They really outplayed Southern Cal for the majority of the night, except that last drive. They held Kalen Williams in check all night. They made that last drive down the field to score the winning touchdown. You know, and, and against USC, whose defense is starting to improve, you know, you can't commit the four turnovers like they did. I think they're going to have their hands full on the road uh, with Utah. You know, you go back to that Florida game and uh, a game that I had the uh, Utes in that particular game. I think you had the Utes as well. Uh, yep. Yep. You know, Florida in that game, 280 yards rushing, but the Utes missed 27 tackles in that game, which is just unfathomable. I, I, it's just, I mean, it's just an incredible number to miss 27 tackles. Now, since then, of course, they have certainly rebounded, beating Southern Utah, San Diego State, and Arizona State. Big deal. But you're right. This is a game which I think it was such a demoralizing loss for Oregon State, that 17-14 loss at home against USC when the Trojans scored that touchdown, as you pointed out, with a minute 13 to play. And Chance Nolan, their quarterback, four interceptions. Props to their defense, so they held that high-flying USC offense to just 357 total yards. A couple areas of concern, however, 
when they were playing, and I'm talking about Utah at Arizona State last week, and they covered the spread easily. Um, Thomas, uh, Utah's uh, top running back, Tavian Thomas, didn't play in the first half because Kyle w Whittingham had said, uh, and this is a quote, consistency and accountability on and off the field were the issues that was keeping uh, Thomas from being restored as the team's featured back. Oh, that is problematic as far as I'm concerned when it comes to handicapping any game involving Utah because he and Cam Rising, they are the engines that keep that Utah offense going. The other thing, they lost their starting tight end and leading pass catcher as well to a season-ending knee injury. I don't know if you saw that in the Arizona State game. Yeah. He had 50 catches last year, 19 catches already this year. So that's Rising's go-to guy. I, I still am with you in a revenge spot playing at home. I would go ahead and lay the 10 points. I would obviously feel a lot better if it was seven. But, you know, we don't get to make the lines. We only get to play the numbers. So I'm with you. I'd go with Utah. But um, not uh, even though we were both on Oregon State last week, not a game I'm particularly enthralled with. Um, oh, here's one. We were both on Kansas. You know, I've been speaking highly of Kansas all season. And... Uh, there you go, Kansas, 4-0 after a 35-27 win over Duke, covering the spread. First 4-0 start since 2009. Uh, I don't know if anybody out there is even familiar with Jalen Daniels, but the guy just had another incredible game last week against the Blue Devils. 19 for 23, 324 yards, four touchdowns through the air, and a team-high 83 yards rushing. And this is perhaps the most incredible stat involving Kansas for me. Last week, that offensive line, which has been blowing open holes for the Kansas ground game, allowed its first sack of the season. Three-and-a-half-point favorite, Iowa State, though, in Lawrence. Go figure. Yeah, go figure, Al. I'm going to be all over Kansas as well. Um, this team, you know, that quarterback, Jalen Daniels, he is your true run-pass quarterback, double, th double, uh, double threat quarterback, really doing well. Um, like his play, uh, they're, they're just on a roll, and they've got a lot of revenge against Iowa State. They've lost seven straight to the Cyclones, 11 of the last 12. Uh, I like Kansas. This is, again, love them at home getting the points. This is, yeah, first big test to go 5-0. and and, you know, Al, they're looking for their second straight sellout in 13 years in Lawrence. So this should be a big crowd. It, it, it was a big crowd last week against Duke. And I expect an even uh, bigger and more boisterous crowd when a Big, ten, a big, uh, big 12 opponent comes into town uh, to face the Jayhawks. You know, when I look at Iowa State and I go, who have they really done anything against this week, year? I mean, they, they beat Southeast Missouri State. They beat Iowa. Okay, they won on the road, but we've seen how Iowa is nothing to be bragging about. They beat Ohio. Last week, we split. I was on Baylor. I think you were on Iowa State. Uh, and that snapped their 11-game home winning streak. But you come in here and you look at the way Baylor beat them last week. Baylor dominated the line of scrimmage. They had a nice pass-run ratio. They had a time of possession of almost 34 and a half minutes, and I see that as the recipe for success for Kansas. Because let's face it, Kansas does not have much of a defense. I mean, Duke, my God, Duke isn't that good, and Kansas allowed the Dukies to have 463 yards in there. But that Kansas offense is for real. Yeah. If I had said to you coming into this preview or into this show, which team leads the Big 12 in red zone offense, Kansas, I don't think, would have right. been anybody's choice. Right. Uh, right. That red zone offense, 22 of 24 with 20 touchdowns. I mean, that's yeah. the productivity that you just can't beat. Yeah. And, you know, Al, the Iowa State last week only had 66 yards rushing against Baylor. So they're going to struggle. And a win by Kansas, they are on the verge of the top 25. I, I know it's been a long, long time since they've cracked the top 25. And a win this week over Iowa State, that'll get them in the top 25 because they're, they're right there at 26. So they're just a couple of points away from that last spot in the, in the national rankings. Boy, it just shocks me. You go on the road, you beat the hell out of West Virginia, you beat the hell out of Houston, you come home, you, you get the job done against Duke, and you still can't crack the top 25? Again, go figure. Uh, oh, this is a good one. Another SEC showdown. Alabama 
17-point favorite at Arkansas. Now Alabama's been beating up everybody in Tuscaloosa. Their one road game, we know what happened there, barely survived in Austin against Texas. Arkansas shoulda, coulda, woulda, but didn't win at Texas A&M. If you looked at the box score, you would have thought that they did. I mean, what they did against A&M, uh, 8 for 17 on third and fourth downs. They held A&M to 4 for 12 on third downs. They outgained A&M 415 to 343 but they still lost the game. Too many points for the Crimson Tide to be laying here? A uh, lot of points, Al, for an SEC rival at home. Um, this has been a series dominated by Alabama, who's won the last 15 straight. As a matter of fact, Arkansas hasn't led in a game against Alabama since 2015 when they led 7-3. to three. Um, Like you said earlier, Arkansas should have won that game last week. That fumble on the goal line, that was a 14-point swing. And you know what, Al? If that game was played in Fayetteville or College Station, those goalposts wouldn't have been been as high in those stadiums like they did with the NFL goalposts. That wouldn't have hit the top of the goalposts, and that would be a different story for the Razorbacks. And, Al, you know what? Bama, 9-10 and against the spread in their last uh, 19 road games in the SEC. I'm going to grab the points this week with Arkansas and look for a big crowd big crowd there, boisterous crowd. Love the quarterback. Uh, the defense needs to play better. I just think Arkansas, hey, they kept it close last year in Tuscaloosa, losing only by seven. I'm going to grab the 17-and-a-half out at Arkansas this week. I'm with you as well. I mean, this Arkansas pass rush uh, lead the nation in sacks with 20, which is a good thing because their uh, pass defense overall is pathetic. Uh, matter of fact, their pass D is 126th ranked out of 131 teams, and they only moved up a few notches because Texas A&M's offense was so pathetic. Right. They right. didn't do much. But I'm with you. I, Alabama uh, has been struggling to push the ball down the field through the air because they don't have that talented crew of receivers they had last year. I think that Arkansas will be able to run the ball. I don't think it's going to be a high-scoring game. I don't know if Arkansas can win the game, but you're no. giving me 17 points at home? I don't care if Arkansas wins the game. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. Give me the yeah. home doggy yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, exactly, Al. Uh, and the defensive coordinator, Al, oh, God, Barry Odom, the guy that was at Missouri, He's the D.C. there at Arkansas. Did a great job last year uh, uh, shutting down. Well, he didn't shut down Alabama, but they kept the game close. And he's going to, you know, I'm sure he'll be scheming something up this week at home. I just think it's a big play at home for Arkansas. Um, you know, and like you said, grabbing all those points, uh, I can't lay with Alabama. You know, they didn't do it against Texas. They've struggled over the years at A&M. They did at Mississippi State, LSU. You know, this just seems to be one of those games out where Arkansas – you know, could hang into the middle of the fourth quarter, you know, by by six points or less. A couple of ACC games coming up next. Now, both of these may be affected by the hurricane, depending on its path up the west coast of Florida. Don't know, as again, we're recording this on Tuesday night, whether it'll affect the panhandle of Texas, uh, specifically Tallahassee. But at this point, the Florida State Wake Forest game is still a go. Uh, for Saturday, although they have canceled all classes uh, at Florida State. But the Seminoles are a seven-point favorite at home against Wake Forest. And, Rick, this is another one of those games, like we talked about a few other teams here, like, for example, Oregon State against Utah, where after that emotional roller coaster of a game, that crushing double overtime loss to Clemson, how did the Demon Deacons rebound, or can they rebound, in this spot on the road. Yeah, a tough situation for uh, Wake Forest coming into Tallahassee. Florida State off to four, a 4-0 start, their first 4-0 start since 2015. Also returned to the uh, national rankings for the first time in four years. I think uh, Wake Forest is going to have their hands full with Florida State. Uh, they're number one in the ACC in passing. We know Sam Hartman's a good quarterback. Terrible at running the ball, 12th in the ACC in rushing. Um, I think they're going to have their hands full with that uh, Florida State defense. I like the Florida State offense, which ranks first in the ACC. This has been a ser series that is, over the years has been dominated by uh, Florida State. But Wake Forest has won the last two, so I'm looking for a big revenge game for Florida State on Saturday. I'll lay the seven and take the Seminoles. Yeah, I agree with you, too, because when I look at this uh, particular 
uh, spot. You know, you had mentioned Florida State's offense. Jordan Travis has had a really under the radar strong start for the Seminoles. Uh, 65.9% completions, 945 yards, five touchdowns. But he's also a dual threat quarterback. He can definitely move the chains with his legs. One thing I wanted to point out to you or, or just kind of throw open for discussion, when I look at Sam Hartman's performance last week against Clemson, and this is not to downplay how good of a quarterback he is, because after all, he is the career passing leader at Wake Forest with over 10,000 career yards, but 337 yards and six touchdowns against Clemson, a Clemson team that, as I pointed out last week in the show, was without three starters in the secondary, without one starter on the defensive line, without one key backup on the defensive line, that is not a very good Clemson defense. And I think Hartman's numbers, 337 yards, six touchdowns, a little bit inflated because he was not playing your typical good Clemson defense. Right. Plus, he got them at home, Al. And I think it's going to be a big difference down in at Florida State this year, uh, at Florida State this week, for him to go in there and try and pull out a victory. I just don't. Uh, I, I'm on Florida State this week. I, I like them. Uh, they're, they're rebuilding that program, and they might be turning that corner finally. And uh, to get a win over Wake Forest at home, I, I certainly think they can do that and cover the number. Something else to consider, guys. And listen, this is just human nature. You know, Wake Forest may have some travel difficulties uh, getting to this particular game. And it's something you always have to factor into the equation in spots like this. By the way, the Wake Forest defense allowed 559 yards to Clemson. Clemson's offense is nothing to speak of. Uh, the next game, speaking of Clemson, now the Tigers are a six and a half point favorite at home against NC State. We remember what happened last year in Raleigh. Uh, NC State uh, won that game. Devin Leary had a big game last season. Uh, you know, I mean, does NC State do it again? They won last year 27 21 in overtime with Leary. 32 for 44, 238 yards and four touchdowns. The thing that really impressed me when I think back to that game last year because I had NC State in that contest is that their defense held Clemson, again, Clemson's offense, struggling last year too, 214 yards. And their time of possession, 42 minutes in this game, in that game. But now they're on the road and they're getting six and a half points. Do you like the dog in this spot? Al, I don't. I'm going to lead toward Clemson in Death Valley. I like the way Uwe Alonga played last week. He threw for 371 yards, five touchdowns. He might be rising again. That was his best game last week. A series totally dominated by Clemson at home. Uh, NC State hasn't won in Death Valley since 2002. And you know what? I was high, very high on Devin Leary, NC State's quarterback at the start of the season. Just not that uh, I'm just not that impressed with him. It all started in the East Carolina game, the opener, when they scored 21 first-half points, did not score a point again. We're lucky to come away with a victory. And he's, he's just around 60% as a pass, as passer as passing. So um, I, I'm going to lean with Clemson this week. Uh, you know, again, a raucous crowd at home, uh, looking to get avenge last year's lost to NC State. Now, I checked the weather report before we came on. This could be a scary situation because – Again, the track of the hurricane is unpredictable, but the remnants of the hurricane, they're calling right now, as we do this show on Tuesday night, 90% chance of rain on Saturday morning, 70% chance of rain Saturday night. Winds could be anywhere from 10 to 25 miles per hour. <sighs> you know, Death Valley could be a swamp uh, when they play this game. So I don't know. I, I have to be honest with you. And I always say there's nothing wrong with admitting when you don't have a clue, just because we're handicappers, we do this 365 days a year. Doesn't mean you have the answer for every game. And when there's 50, 60 games on a Saturday, this is just one, I wouldn't even play this in a teaser. Right. I, yeah. I just, I, right. I don't know which way to go. Uh, I, but I will sell, tell you that other than the game against Utah, uh, I'm sorry, UConn last week where uh, Devin Leary threw for 320 yards and four touchdowns, that's about the only game that I can say that he really impressed me. I was very impressed right. with his play last year, but hasn't looked sharp, hasn't looked sharp at all. Um, again, guys, let me remind you that you get my best bet and the best bets of all the handicappers at sportsadvisors.com for free using the one-day all-access pass. 
you have nothing to lose other than bypassing this opportunity to get all the plays for free. It's a $99 value normally, but you get it for free and you get to pick the day that you want to take that opportunity. So check it out, the one day free all access pass over at thesportsadvisors.com. Well, Rick, we're going to cap this show with a very interesting game here. Oklahoma coming off the shocking loss at home against Kansas State against TCU. Now, I was on TCU last week. You liked SMU. I don't think a lot of people out there realize what a big, big rivalry game that was. TCU beating SMU last week on the road in Dallas, 42-34, to to improve the Horned Frogs record to 3-0. and So I look at this game, though, not only is TCU maybe coming off a little bit of a letdown with a huge game against the Sooners, but I think that if you like Oklahoma in this contest, you're getting tremendous line value because A, TCU won, and the Sooners lost. If Oklahoma had beaten Kansas State, no matter what TCU did, Oklahoma's a nine and a half point favor. You're getting at least a field goal value if you like Oklahoma. If you like TCU, that value evaporated when the Sooners lost. Yeah. Um, You know, Al, over the years, I'm not a trendy player as far as playing trends, as far as this team on the third Saturday in October, if they're laying more than 20 following a five-point loss, that's who to – no. This, one of my – kind of my mini trends is a home team grabbing points that's good, that's playing one of their rivals that's even nationally ranked. We're going to say Oklahoma, yes, they're going to look to rebound coming off the loss, but maybe they're just not that good. I'm leaning toward TCU grabbing the points – that Sonny Dykes is turning that program around, which was in chaos last year when they ousted Gary Patterson, uh, the legendary Gary Patterson, at the middle of the year. They ended up losing five of their last seven. And I know he wasn't starting at c- certain times last year, but with the injury to their quarter, Max Dugan has really done a heck of a job for the Horned Frogs this year. Off to that 3-0 and start, 22 of 29 last week, 278 yards, three touchdowns. Again, I think it's going to be crazy in Fort Worth bringing the Sooners in. Um, they just they just might not be that good. It's Oklahoma. We're going by the brand again. You know, that's, you know, um, I like TCU grabbing the points. We're almost getting a touchdown out, and it may even go up more. So I'll take the home dog. Well, you know, the Sooners' defense wasn't any good last year, right? And they were exposed by Kansas State last week. They, yeah, yeah. I mean— Third and fourth down, Kansas State was 10 for 19. 509 total yards for the Wildcats. 5.6 yards per carry. Time of possession for Kansas State, 35 minutes. This game wasn't in Manhattan. It was in Norman. And then you look at Adrian Martinez. uh, 21 for 34, 234 yards passing, 148 yards rushing, five total touchdowns. What What type of quarterback is Adrian Martinez? He's a versatile, dual threat quarterback. And that goes to the numbers that you were just pointing out about Max Dugan, who's a little more physical, bigger, and a better passer than Adrian Martinez. There you go. Yep. yep. So that's why I'm with you. True, you're not getting the value you would have gotten with Oklahoma should they have won last week. But at six and a half, I can easily buy up to the seven. And, you know, I think uh, another aspect of this game is. 67 and a half points the total doesn't that seem a little low for you in this contest yeah that's a little low i think this uh, this could be a track meet again al uh but like you said dylan gate or uh, adrian martinez man he was their offense that's only the little thing that scares me about that is that he's such a dual threat last week rolled up the big yardage last week against oklahoma where dugan's gonna sit in that pocket and he's gonna you know hope you know hope he's accurate and on his game on saturday but he's more of a pocket passer than um, than Martinez is. But you know he could sit back there and pick and pick that Oklahoma secondary apart. Hey, if Adrian Martinez can do it, and he's not that great of a passer, I think Dugan Dugan certainly can do it. I'm with you. I'm definitely taking uh, TCU in that spot. And guys, that'll do it for this week's show. Remember. Uh, Subscribe to the channel so you're always alerted when the show will be available. You can also, of course, always download the podcast. It's available on Spotify, the Apple Podcast Network, Stitcher, over on iHeartRadio as well. And make sure you catch the NFL pregame show I do with Steve Buda. It's always available on Thursdays. 
from thesportsadvisors.com. I'm Al DeMarco along with Rick Torino and wish you well and hope you all make some money this weekend. Good luck, everybody.